There we go. Okay. So recording is on. I know the mic is good. The video is good too. So last Thursday we talked about you know how to add the content or the value of one register to another register, and the idea is to identify what paths do I need to set up between the components, and then you know we go like, oh, okay, so that, so that means so this switch needs to point this way, that switch needs to point that way, and this has to be enabled, that has to be disabled, and so on and so forth. Okay, so. Once you understand the multiplexers and the demultiplexers, how they work, and also the registers and also RAM, the, the rest is really just a lot of, you know, just insane amount of details, okay, just tedious. So what we're gonna do today is to talk about um, instructions or how we can move or copy content you know, between RAM and the registers, okay? So that's gonna be the focus of today's lecture. The lab for today, is only involving content that we have already talked about on last Thursday. So if you got a chance to rewatch the video or you got your hand your notes already taken and you got a chance to kind of digest all that stuff, you should be ready for the lab today. Do we have any questions before I start? We do not have any questions. All right. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I am going to plant a particular value somewhere in RAM, let's say right here. I'll give it more or less a random value. Let's say, you know, 7D, okay, for no particular reason. I just, you know, put 7D at this you know, location here. Can someone tell me what is that location? How do we read the RAM module so that I know the location of the 7D? It's zero E, that is correct. So it's zero E is the location because the leftmost column, which is sort of in gray, but you may not be able to see the gray. So the gray column is indicating the address of the leftmost item on each row. So that means you know, this zero, these zero, zero is at location zero C. So this would be zero D and this would be 0E, okay? So that's how we read the content, you know, given the, the RAM component. All right, so let's just say that my objective is to copy this byte, which is 7D at location 0E, 7D in 0E into the register bank, and we'll just randomly pick a register, let's say register C. And that's what we want to do. So I will do exactly what I did last time. I'm going to remind myself what we want to accomplish, and then we'll go ahead and try to figure out you know, what pathway do we need to um, establish in order to do that. Um, hmm. I'm just thinking you know, that may be a little bit... Okay, so we'll, we'll do two things, okay? So let me let me just kind of... <clears throat> revise a little bit of what I need to do. Give me a second here to start up the text editor because I want to use that to remind ourselves you know, what we are trying to accomplish here. <clears throat> so I'm going to do the same thing as last time, except this time I'm going to say register, uh, I think C, is going to get the content of whatever another register is pointing to. So I'm going to just you know, pick register B this time. So whatever register B has is an address, and we want to copy whatever content that register B is pointing to in RAM and copy that to register C. So in order for this to work, I'm going to have to plant a particular value into register B first, which is the location of the 7D that we just talked about earlier. So I'm just going to be planting 0E into register B at this point. So I'll pause a little bit and see if there are any questions. So does, yeah, go ahead. We'll do it the same way as last time. We'll figure out the pathway, and then we'll go ahead and you'll know, figure out, then we'll go back and actually look at the opcode, and then hand assemble, and then go through the assembler, and then run the actual code. 
Okay. So it's going to be the same approach, but I'm going to shortcut a few things. In other words, I'm not going to go over the three phases of executing an instruction uh, consisting of fetch, decode, and ex execute. Okay, so we just we'll just focus on execute because we talked about you know decode already and also fetch already. So those two will be kind of like I'll just kind of go through those two really fast without explaining. Okay, but this is what we want to do. This is actually you know um, using C syntax. The asterisk is the dereference operator. And B is representing register B, C is representing register C, and your B has an initial value of 0E at this point, and I just want to use register B to tell me where to copy 8-bit from RAM into register C in this case. So is that understood? Is the RTL understood? Okay, this is the RTL. Can someone remind me what RTL represents? Ah, I, I can keep this awkward, you know, silence going. Does anyone remember what RTL stands for in this class? Seriously? All right, well, in that case, yes, register transfer language is the answer, okay? And which column in the opcode table is giving you the RTL? of each instruction. The third one, that is correct, register, I mean, uh, column C, okay? Very good, okay. So keep that in mind, okay? Column C of the opcode table, which is a Google Sheet, you know, spreadsheet, is giving you the RTL of what an opcode is trying to do, okay? All right, so this is what we want to do, and I am going to string this as much as possible so this way it doesn't take up too much space on the screen, but we do want it to be up all the time just so that I can reference it as we try to work out you know, what we need to work out. All right, so given this is what we want to do, what is the few components that we know for sure are needed? Okay, if you just look at the, the highlighted text, the RTL itself, can you automatically identify the three things that we need in order for this to work? Well, who are the participants in this particular thing that we are trying to accomplish? Okay, very good. So, so there goes two out of the three, right? Very good. So we have register C being updated. We have register B somehow participating. What is the third component? The, 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 the asterisk operator implies the third component, and what component are we talking about? Hmm? The dereference operator is implying a third component being useful in this case. Yes. Okay, but who, which component deals with needs an address? RAM, very good. Okay, so RAM is the third component, okay? So we got two registers and RAM, and they are, they are playing some parts in this whole thing. Register C needs to be updated, okay? So looking at the circuit right now, this is register C. So how can I convince register C, hey, you need to update on the next rising edge? <clears throat> what, what do we need to set up in addition to the rising edge clock? The what? Reg in, okay, very good. So somehow <clears throat> we need reg in to be connected to register B, but that's okay. It's always connected, right? This is always connected. Um, but how do we convince that only register B out of the four registers to be the one to update? I mean, register C, sorry. Register C is the one being updated. I kept saying register B, but it's register C. So how do we convince register C and go like, hey, you need to update on the rising edge. Sorry? Very good, register, reg in cell. Okay, very good. Reg in cell needs to be one zero. Okay, so we'll write it down. So reg, reg in cell, which is also known as um, R I cell, register input select. 
that needs to be a, z a one zero, okay? Because we need, I would, what I was asking is the enable of register C needs to be a one, okay? But how does that become a one? Well, where is it coming from? You track down this wire, it's coming out of output two, which is one zero, of this decoder. So the question now is, how do I convince the decoder so that only output two is a one and everything else are zeros? So what is a decoder again? It's a demultiplexer where the input is a constant of one. Okay, very good. So in that case, that means, you know, first of all, it has to be enabled itself. So in N or input enable needs to be a one, very good. So we'll write that down too. So in N, which is the same as R-I-E-N, register input enable, needs to be a one. So with these two configured the way that I have put it into <clears throat> the text editor, then we know that this wire going into the enable port of register C will be a one. Is that okay? Which is telling register C is like, Okay, we are going to present something to your D port. On the next rising edge, copy that into your content and output it at the same time. Okay, very good. Next, okay, the next question is a little bit harder to, an to answer right now, is how do I get register B to become the address of the RAM component? Because that's what we are asking, right? You know, right here, because I'm treating register B as a pointer, and in order for register B to be to act like a pointer, the content of register B needs to be presented to the address port of RAM. Okay, first of all, I'm gonna pause and ask, does that make sense? Okay, all right. <clears throat> so right now, I can kind of look, ugh. okay, we don't know exactly which register output we need to use, and frankly, I cannot remember either. Even though I designed this whole thing, there, there, it's just a lot of detail. I cannot remember all the detail. So I'm just you know, going to figure this out as you figure it out. But how do you figure it out? So tell me how you are going to figure that out. How do I figure out the connection between the A port of RAM and register B in this case? What process would you go through? Say again? Trace the line. Okay, very good. But before I trace the line, since I'm here already, I'm going to go figure out a few things here, okay? Because a lot of some of the control signals uh, going into the RAM module, I kind of need to configure those as well in order for this instruction to work. So we're going to take a closer look at the control lines of RAM, and we'll take a look at each one individually and ask, what does that need to be? RAM cell, okay? Can someone tell me what RAM cell needs to be? Sorry? One, very good. Because we want RAM to do something, and in order for RAM to do something, it has to be quote unquote selected first. So RAM cell is doing pretty much the same thing as the enable of a register, okay? Except in this case, even if you just want RAM to output the content of a location, you still need RAM cell to be a one. Okay, very good. What about RAM load? Should it be uh, a one or a zero, or it doesn't matter? It needs to be a one, because a one of load means you be a reading from RAM. Okay, very good, so that needs to be a one. Um, let's see, what else? I think that's all we need, okay? RAM clock is a whole different thing. We don't have to worry about RAM clock for the, for the time being. Okay, so now we can track down the line. So now we use the poking tool, which is great for tracking down lines because it will highlight the entire node. So we look at this node and go like, oh man, you know, it ends right here. So at this point, what are you going to do? Okay, so I'm just gonna show you the relevant part of the diagram and see, see if you can visually track down you know, what we need to do with this multiplexer. So the multiplexer has two inputs, right? And the job of a multiplexer is to connect up to one input to the output of the multiplexer. I said up to one because if the multiplexer can be enabled or disabled, it can be connecting none of the input to the output. So that's why I said up to one. 
But since in this case, we know for sure the output is used, which input am I going to connect to the output? Huh? The one coming from the D multiplexer. So that would be which input? Input zero or input one? Input zero, very good. So this is input zero, so that means address mux needs to be, all right, yes. So this is a zero, okay. So what you need to write down, okay, what, what, is, uh, what I'm talking about but is not a part of the screen and that's something you probably need to digest a little bit and write down is the approach, okay, how, where do I start, okay, and how, what is the process of figuring this out, okay? Because everything else is being recorded. You can always just get back to this moment in the recording and, you know, get back to it. Okay, so now if we look at this and go like, um, looks like there's only one way to connect one of the outputs from the register bank to the address port of RAM, and it's coming out of here which means this particular demultiplexer is actually important. So what do you think the, uh, this is register output one demux, and what do you think that needs to be? It needs to be a zero, very good, because we are connecting the input. There's only one input, you don't get to select the input in this case, but we want that input to go to output zero, so the select corresponding to this demultiplexer has to be a zero. Very good. So now we write that down. This needs to be a zero. And that also answered one of our earlier questions, which is which output of the register bank is going to drive the address bus? We know, you know it is output one. So once we know that, we have a few additional questions. In other words, once we know the output one, that output one of the register bank is being used, I automatically have to answer the question of what is register output one select? What do you think it is? Zero one, very good, because we need register B to connect to output one of the register bank. So that tells me that register output one select needs to be a zero one. Now, I spell out both digits because it is a two-bit um, port. This is a two-bit port, this is a two-bit port, and this is also a two-bit port. All right, very good. And I think that's it. Yeah, I think that is it, okay? So in order for this to happen, these things need to be the way they are. Then someone may ask, what about uh, the ALU enable thing? The ALU enable thing, eh, we can turn it on, but it's not really doing any calculation, so we're gonna keep it off, okay? So anything that you're not using, it's probably a good idea to turn it off and so that it doesn't do anything that you're not expecting to happen. So we'll just turn off things that we do not need. So the ALU EN is a zero. So if the ALU is turned off, um, do you think it matters at all what I specify as ALUOP, the, so the operation? It doesn't really matter, okay? So technically speaking, anything can be those three bits because we can select from one of eight operations. There are only six right now, but you know, there are three bits involved. So that means you know, ALUOP, the operation, is like, eh, we don't really care. So. But you know, unfortunately, I cannot just say we don't care, okay? Because you know, every bit needs to be a zero or a one. So the default is, eh, we'll just keep those as zeros. So this is how we work with you know all of the other ones. You know, the program uh, counter enable is going to be a zero because we won't, we don't, we are not going to update the program counter. So the enable needs to be a zero. And as a result, whatever controls you know how we're going to update the program counter. It's really not relevant. So PC Mux is like whatever is fine, okay, you know. But what is PC Mux? PC Mux is actually here. It is not coming straight out of the ROM. It is the output of this particular multiplexer. This multiplexer is in return controlled or selected 
by PC Mux Mux because it's a multiplexer that controls another multiplexer. That's why it's called Mux Mux. Okay. Um, it doesn't really matter what it, whatever it is, it's fine because the program counter is not getting updated anyway. So it would not matter what this thing ends up at, and that thing is the output of this multiplexer, which also means you know this select really doesn't matter at this point. Well, if it doesn't matter, we'll just default it to zero. But do we have to default it to zero? The answer is no. Okay, I can default it to zero one one if I wanted to. It simply does not matter. So technically speaking, PC mux mux is don't care. PC mux mux is technically yeah whatever it is is fine. But because we can't really just specify, you know, we don't care. You know, it's not a zero or one. So in this case, we'll just go like, oh, okay, we'll find, we'll default it to zero, zero, zero. It doesn't mean that it has to be zero, zero, zero. It simply means that this is one of eight possible values for PC mux mux. So are we clear on this concept? On certain bits, okay, you know, it means it has a value of zero or has a value of one. Not because it has to, it simply means, it is simply because we have to give it a particular value so we can just quote unquote default to all zeros in most cases. Yes? Huh? They cannot be floating. Yep, they cannot be floating. At least in this processor, they are not designed to, to, be, to have the option of floating. Yep, okay. Uh, we have a few other things. The instruction register has its own enable bit. You know, that needs to be turned off to. Uh, that one is really, it doesn't have a name, by the way. Because if you try to track down this particular connection, it does not have a name. It doesn't have a tunnel. It is simply known as bit zero of um, the output of ROM. So that has to be a zero to. So anyway, um, I think we have determined most of the control signals you know, in order for this instruction to execute. So this is how we determine the content of the location in ROM that is corresponding to the opcode of this instruction. Okay. Was that sentence understood? Okay. Because I'm, I just mumbled a whole bunch of terms each term individually is a term that you already understand. The question is, as phrases and also as a sentence, do you know what I meant? Okay. I cannot remember what I just said. <laughs> I think, okay, I think I can paraphrase. What I said is, I think we have determined the individual bit value of the location that is corresponding to the opcode responsible to implement what we want to do, which is register C gets whatever content in RAM that register B is pointing to. Okay, all right. So we'll keep this up for now, and we're gonna switch to the browser. Okay, so we will switch to the browser and take a look at the opcode table, and I'm not sure whether the opcode table is somewhere else, I will look for that. Yep, opcode table is somewhere else on this side. I will just bring it up to this browser. There we go. All right. So can somebody tell me which role corresponds to the instruction that we are trying to work out? Go ahead. Oh, okay. 20. So you are correct, okay? So when you look at row 20 of the spreadsheet, when you look at column C of row 20, ah, that looks exactly like the one that we're dealing with. Some register C is getting the dereferenced uh, value of register Y. So X can be one of the four registers, Y can be one of the four registers, so it meets the format or the template of what we are trying to accomplish. Does that make sense? Okay. So that means we just have to look at row 20, okay? The, the, the rest of the rows, eh, not too useful at this point. So we'll just kind of focus on this one, I'll magnify a little bit. <clears throat> and now we can try to figure out the opcode of that instruction. 
So the opcode of that instruction means, you know, this means it has to start with 0, 1, 1, 1. That has to be the left hand side of the hexadecimal digits. The question is, what do I want for x, x, y, y? So when you look at x, x, which is you know, the two bits representing register x in column, x, uh, column C, and then y, y are the two bits corresponding to register y on column C, um, if I, so look up the, uh, okay, I just scrolled off that part in the text editor, but it's okay, we can scroll it back in. So what do we need as x, x? One zero, very good, okay. So that means you know, we have one zero here. And what about register Y? Zero one, very good, okay. So this is the binary bit pattern of the opcode that corresponds to what we want to do, okay? We want register C to store the value at, locate, at the location that register B is pointing to in RAM. Are we still doing okay so far? We good? Okay. Question? No? Okay. Um, so this is um, in hexadecimal. This is 7, 9. So, okay. So we can now check out whether 7, 9 is indeed accomplishing what we want it to accomplish. All right. So what I have just done is not only to figure out the pathway within the processor of how do we get this done, but also to hand assemble the opcode 79 in hexadecimal, representing the bit pattern of 0111-1001. That is the opcode, which is the, what is the what the processor can readily understood, readily understand. We have just hand assembled the entire opcode. Okay. So what we'll do now is we're switching back to Logisim, and, and then we go to RAM location 00, zero and we'll just over type it. We'll type over with, uh, what was it again? 79, right? 79, and then the next location, which really don't, I don't need to change it, you know, but we'll put a 01 here. Yes. You're correct. We should probably confirm that one too. Because uh, there might be a few control lines in between that we need to switch. Okay, very good. So I did forget to do that. So now we have to look at the D port and make sure that it is connecting to register C in this case. So we highlight this one. And you can see how it really goes all the way to this multiplexer. And we just need to say, okay, input zero needs to connect to the output of this multiplexer. So RI mux is one thing that I forgot to, sp you know, to specify. It needs to be a zero. So very good. Okay, I, I totally forgot about that one. So RI mux needs to be a zero. So very good. Thank you. Because that was the only missing piece that I forgot to mention. Okay, all right, very good. So now we are ready to run the program. So when we run the program, as I said a little bit earlier, I was relying on everyone in this class to review the material from last Wednesday or last Thursday. So I'm going to just kind of quickly run through the fetch and the decode part of executing instruction, and we'll only be focus on, focusing on the execute part of the instruction execution cycle. So here we go, control T, control T, control T, control T, and there we go. So this is right after decode. Do you see how there's a certain pattern here? The opcode is a 79, okay? It is stored in the instruction register. I am not going to repeat the instruction of how it got there, okay? The fetch cycle is responsible to put 79 and copy that from RAM location 00 into the instruction register. How does it know to go to register, not register, but location 00 to fetch the instruction? We talked about it last Thursday already, so I'm not going to repeat that. Okay, this is the beauty of having my lectures recorded. I can just tell people to go back and watch it again. Or, you know, better yet, if you have taken notes on that day or if you're taking notes after rewatching the video, it's already on your notes. 
What about the people who have not done that? Well, then do it. Okay, that's the whole point. Okay, you know, it is important to take notes. If you cannot take notes when you're watching this and trying to understand what's going on, then you have to do it after the lecture. Do not delay that process. So anyway, that 7.9 somehow got into U code pointer. That's the job of the decode cycle. And because the micro code pointer now has 7.9.0, location 7.9.0 in ROM is now selected. So the bit pattern at location 7.9.0, which is this a whole bunch of bits here, is now presented at the data port of ROM, which means it goes everywhere in the processor. So what we need to do now is to double check and say, are we really sure this is you know, what we want? So we're going to go back and check. Yes? Mm -hmm. Not exactly. So the fetch cycle, it happens on the rising edge. The decode cycle happens on the falling edge, but not right after that rising edge. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are going to double check everything here. Okay, we want to double check RI cell register input select is a one zero. Okay, so RI cell is right here. Click on it. Ah, I cannot. <laughs> this is not selectable because of the um, selection of the register bank is too big. So it can be seen here. Okay, this is the same thing. It is indeed one zero. Uh, R-I-E-N, which is the same thing as input enable, is indeed a one. Um, let's go back to main. R-I-Mux is indeed a zero. Okay, we put it right here, and you know you made that correction, or you reminded me that we need to double check that one too. Uh, RAM cell should be a one. So we go to RAM and say, oh, okay, RAM cell is indeed a one. RAM load should be a one, and RAM load is indeed a one. Address mux should be a zero. Address mux is indeed a zero. Register output one dmux needs to be a zero. So it is indeed a zero. Register output one select needs to be a zero one. So that means this wire needs to be a zero one, and it is indeed a zero one. Um, everything else you know, should be disabled or just by default zero, so I'm not going to be going over all of those other things. Okay. But that means you know, on the next rising edge, we really should be updating register C to the content in RAM that register B is pointing to, which is 7D. So the question is, is that going to be what is going to happen? We can double check. So we go to register bank, and then we, we ask, what is going into the D port of register C? It is 1101. Well, that is 7D in hexadecimal. Is register C enabled? Yes. Are we about to have a rising edge? Yes. So that means I got all everything already you know, set up. And on the control T right here, it is updated to 7D, accomplishing exactly what I set out to do with the RTL description of what we just did. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Seven D, not seven nine. Yeah, this one? Yeah. That is the opcode. So the opcode specifies, okay, so if you were to kind of break up the, the opcode. This part has to be the way it is, simply because it's a constant. This is XX, and this is YY. So as XX, it means you know, these two bits are specifying which register do I want to use as quote-unquote X, and that would be register C. Register C is one zero, and these two are specifying register Y, and we need register B as quote-unquote Y, and that's why we specify zero one. Right? Are we doing okay with that? All right. Okay. So we have just talked about the construction of yet another opcode and how it gets the job done.
Okay. So let's try another one. Okay. Yo, so we'll try another one. And this one is a little bit more interesting. Okay. <clears throat> so what I'll do is I'm going back to main. And this time I'm just going to do a reset, you know, basically a process of wide, you know, reset. And I'll close this window for now or, you know, just kind of make it go away for now. Okay. We'll just kind of hide it like that. All right. So this time, okay, control R, reset the processor. So this time, we are going to try to understand what is the LDI instruction. So let's switch to the opcode table and take a look at the LDI instruction, which is row 19, just one row before that. And when you look at uh, column C, this one looks kind of interesting. It's like, hmm, what is it, okay? So as it turns out, there are two ways to look at LDI. If you want to look at exactly what it does, okay, it would be this part here. It just wants to copy a constant. I is a constant. <clears throat> it wants to copy a constant to register X, and X, once again, can be registers A, B, C, or D. Okay? So this is the only way you can initialize a register to a particular value. That's the only way, okay? There are no other ways to initialize a register to some particular value. So it'll go like, hmm, okay, that seems pretty easy to understand. <clears throat> and by the way, LDI, the I stands for immediate. So it is a load immediate instruction as opposed to just LD, which is load. So in this case, you don't have another register to tell you where to copy from RAM. They go like, so how do we know where to copy from? The program counter, okay? So that's why in terms of how it gets the job done, it is the earlier part. So the first part here is telling us how it gets the job done. So this is telling us that the program counter is somehow involved in this process. We go to whatever the program counter is pointing to, and copy that byte to register X. And then because this is a post increment, it means the incrementing of X of PC is after we do the copying. Is that okay? All right, okay. So, hmm, okay. So with this one, I'm going to reverse the process. In other words, I am going to rely on the assembler to give me the instruction, the opcodes, and all the other bytes that are needed, copy that into RAM, and then we'll execute the program step by step. And by the time we get to the execute phase of this opcode, we'll stop, and then we'll take a look at you know, what is happening with the, 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 the various components that are involved here. This, whatever this register is, is involved. The program counter is involved. RAM is also involved. Every time you see the dereference operator, RAM is involved. Is that okay so far or not? Be good? Okay, all right. <clears throat> so let's switch to the assembler. Okay, so the assembler is on this sheet. I'm just gonna copy it over here. There we go. Okay, so this is the assembler. I go to the source tab and then I just you know, delete everything that I got here because you know, I don't need all of those things here. And I'll specify the instruction. We'll just pick register D to be one being updated. And I want it to be updated to the constant of say 49. Okay. And then followed by halt instruction. The halt instruction is not really that important in this context, but it's always good to kind of make sure the program does not run on forever, okay? So the halt instruction makes sure that we don't have a program that runs on forever. Yep? The registers are not variables. They are components inside the processor that can store content. But they are not variables, okay? So because variables live in RAM, and registers are not living in RAM, so they are technically not variables. They are places where you can store a value, that's for sure, but they are not considered variables. 
because variables are in RAM. That is correct. So variables are fairly high-level concepts that we have not, we don't have the tools to talk about variables yet at this point. All right. So register D should be loaded with the value of 49. So now we want to go through the assembling your process. So the assembling process means we go to this table here and we ask, uh, what opcodes should we have? Well, that should be pretty easy because, you know, the zero, okay, let me go back to the text editor, make it visible again. Give me a, right here. Okay, so we'll, I'll just start it with a new window. Okay, there we go. Oh, that doesn't work. All right, so get rid of this. We'll start with a new tab then. New, there we go. So we have a new tab. There we go. All right, so this time what we have is what we want to accomplish is register D gets this PC plus plus like so. And you know, the whatever is next to the opcode needs to be the constant that we need, which in this case is uh, 49. Okay, so we want D to get to 49, but 49 is at the next location. So what the assembler is going to do, okay, if I switch back to the assembler, you can always go to the assemble view and it will show you exactly what code is generated for a particular instruction. So the LDI instruction, LDID 49, is translating into 6F31 in hexadecimal. The 6F is the actual opcode. The 31 is the value that we want to copy to register D. Because what is 31 in hexadecimal? How do you express 31 in hexadecimal in decimal? It's 3 times 16 plus 1, okay, which is 48 plus 1, which is 49. Okay, so that's how 49 is specified. So when you load this program into RAM, okay, so let's go back to Logisim. When you load this program into Logisim, the first location is going to be the opcode, which is the 6F. Okay, click on the first. So this is 6F. The next location is going to be the constant that we want to put into register D, which is our 31 in hexadecimal. And then the last byte here is the halt instruction, which is a 0, 1. So I have just you know, hand typed the entire uh, program into RAM, you know, just basically a copying from the assembler. Do we have any questions at this point? Does everybody understand why we have these three bytes in RAM? Okay, all right. So this time, as I said, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because the program needs to, can only execute when it is in RAM, right? Because that's the whole point of the Vonneman architecture, which is you know we are storing instructions. You know we we're storing the specification of what the processor should do and how to do it in memory, and that's exactly what we're doing here. Okay, so this instruction is a little bit funky because you know, I do have to kind of slow down in the um, in the clock cycles between the fetch and the decode because something happens to the program counter in between, okay? So we'll take a closer look, you know, at those things. And for now, I'm gonna hide this. And I want to make sure that the PC, the program counter is, vi is visible as is um, the microcode pointer. So that, there we go, this view is good because we can see the program counter is zero, zero, and we can see the microcode pointer is zero, 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 and the instruction register is zero, zero, because we just reset the entire thing. Okay, so here we go. This is fetch, and then we have uh, the falling edge after the fetch, which is not really particularly interesting. Now we have a rising edge, okay? This is the rising edge right before decode, because decode happens on the falling edge. How do we know decode is on the falling edge? What is changed in a, in a decode? Yes. The microcode pointer. So how do I know decode has to happen on the falling edge as a result of what you just said? Yep. 
Exactly. So the, the micro code pointer is the only register in the entire processor that updates on the falling edge. Okay, so that's also something that we talked about on last Thursday. So these are the little things that you probably need to write in your notes, okay, because you'll because they're important. All right, so now we are about to have a rising edge. Okay, clock is low right now. We're gonna have a rising edge. So this rising edge is particularly important in this instruction because I want you to take a look at the program counter. The program counter is zero, zero right now, but you can already tell that it's going to update because program counter enable is a one because we have already made use of location zero, zero in RAM. We already fetched that opcode into the instruction register. The program counter can now point to whatever location is next to location zero, zero, which is location zero, one. So when I type control T again on the keyboard, the program counter is now updated to location zero, one. What is at location zero, one? You cannot see it from the screen right now, but I hope you remember what we put into location zero one. The three one, and what is the use of the three one? What is the purpose of that three one in RAM? That's the constant, exactly, okay? So the three one, which is at location zero one right now, is the constant that we want to copy to register D. And the program counter is pointing right at that byte. Yes? Not directly, but pretty close. Okay, so we'll, we'll get to see that. Okay, very good question. All right, so, <clears throat> so the next control T is the decode, which means you know, we are just taking the instruction register left shift by four bits and stash it into the micro code pointer. So what should be the new micro code pointer after Control T. 6F0, very good. Okay, so ready, there we go. So now we need to really slow down because we are now at location 6F0 in ROM, which has the bit pattern to control all the, red, all the uh, register enables, the multiplexers, the demultiplexers, and so on and so forth. So now we need to slow down and take a closer look at, um, so how is everything configured? So remember what I said, there are only four registers, you know, not counting the, uh, the four registers inside the register bank. And then on top of that, RAM is the only active component or the, a component that can actually do something. So we're going to start with RAM and say, okay, what is happening to you, RAM? So we look at the control signals. RAM cell is a one, okay? That's always the first thing to look at is red Steve to see whether the RAM cell is a one, why? What happens when RAM cell is a zero? Go ahead. Exactly, so when RAM cell is a zero, RAM is not paying attention to anything else, which means, yeah, you can specify everything else to be whatever, RAM is just gonna go like, I'm gonna ignore everything else, okay? So when RAM cell is a one, then we have to ask additional questions. So what is the next question that you would ask when once you realize RAM cell is a one, what is the next question? Is it a read or a write? So which control signal would determine that? RAM load, very good. So we can see RAM load is a one, which means we are reading, very good. So once we, are, we know that we are reading from RAM, what are the two additional questions that you should ask? You can always just kind of go through all the ports and ask, is this important, is this important, is this important, is this important? Okay, so what, is, what are the next two questions you should ask yourselves when you realize that RAM cell is a one and RAM load is also a one? Okay, very good. So the, the first question is, who is telling me to look at this location, which is location zero one? Why am I looking at location zero one? Okay. So now you have to track this wire all the way back to this multiplexer. This multiplexer has a select of one, which means we track input one of that multiplexer. And as I said a little bit earlier, the program counter is pretty close to directly connecting to the address port. It is connecting to address to the address port of RAM through a multiplexer. 
Is that okay? So, if I go back to the RTL, <clears throat> and there we go. So if I go back to the RTL, I have just explained the asterisk. I have just explained why PC is inside the parentheses of the asterisk, okay? I haven't really quite explained the plus plus yet, okay? So let's go ahead and explain that one. So when you look at the program counter, you look at the program counter and you go like, hmm, I see a bright green thing going into the program counter. Bright green is a one, so in larger sim, a one is usually enabling something, something is going to happen. So what is this bright green line going into? The enable of the program counter. So when the enable of a register, uh, um, when the enable of a register is a one, the register is quote unquote enabled, which means on the next rising edge, it's going to update. So what is the natural question that you're going to ask? What is updating it or how it is updated? Okay, same question, very good. So now we have to ask, how is it going to be updated? How do we answer that question? Track it down, okay? But where, where do I start? Sorry, say again. The, what is connected to the D port, right? Because the D port is the input of, a pro, of the register, so we track down this wire. It's coming out of a multiplexer. The multiplexer has a select of zero, so now we track down input zero of the multiplexer. It's coming out of an adder. What is, how is the adder configured? It has, an in, it has a carry in of a one, so we are adding one to whatever the input of the adder is, which is the program counter itself. So that means the output of this adder is whatever the program counter is plus one. So that means now we, it looks like we have a raised condition, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but at least for the time being, the current value of the program counter, which is a zero one, is telling RAM and say, hey, pay attention to location one and tell me what it is at the D port. So the next thing we need to do is to track down the D port of RAM and see where it's going. So now we, let me hide this first. So we now track down this wire and go like, okay, who is paying attention to the D port? So with the fetch cycle, the instruction register is paying attention and it gets updated. Not this time, okay, because the enable is a, is a dark green, it's a zero. This is, it doesn't make sense, okay? This is the, the output of the multiplexer and you cannot, it, it cannot serve as an input, okay? So this one is totally, irrelevant. So the other two things is one goes here, which eventually goes to the program counter. But in order for this to update the program counter, we have to have this multiplexer to be a one. So we know this particular connection is irrelevant also. That leaves us with only one possibility, which is this connection here. So that is one of the two inputs of this multiplexer. The select of this multiplexer has a zero, so that means this input zero is connecting to the output. So the next question, so what are you gonna ask now? Okay, we know register, uh, the input of the register bank is presented with something. We can see that RI mux is a zero, and that's kind of explain what we already explained. We know that RIEN is a one, so what is your next question to ask? What does it mean when RIEN is a one? What is about to happen? Some register in the register bank is going to be updated. So what, is, what would be your next question? Which register, exactly. So how do I know which register is gonna be updated? RI cell, very good, okay. But as I said a little bit earlier, I cannot click on this one. So we can go to the register bank, and it's the same thing as this one here. So this is telling me that register D is getting updated. And we can see the bright line, right, with the bright green line tell, is telling us, yep, we are enabling that register. Whatever is presented with is going to become that. So that completes the whole explanation, or so we think, okay? So we think, okay, this has to be it, right? Because if we click on the wire, going into the D port of register D, it is indeed the 49, okay? 
This is not 49 in hexadecimal. This is actually decimal 49. Okay, but if you look at the binary pattern, we get our three one back. Okay, which is three times 16 plus one, which is also 49. So we are now confirming that we are using the right address and the right content in RAM to update register D. But this is not it yet, okay? So on the next rising edge, we are fairly convinced that register D will become 3.1, okay? But there's one little thing that we also have to pay attention to, which is, but hold on a second here. The program counter is also going to be updated. The program counter is going to update itself to 0.2, okay? Because it is also enabled. The D port of the program counter is already 0, 02. All we are missing is a rising edge. Are we doing okay so far with this? Now, if you're, yeah, go ahead. So that is the question, okay? So that is the question. We are right at the time where the next transition of the clock is going to trigger an update of the program counter so it becomes one more than what it used to be, and also register D in the register bank, which is going to grab the content of whatever the RAM is outputting. So if it sounds like we are pulling the rug under ourselves, it would sound like that, okay? In other words, if registers can update like really, really simultaneously, there's no lag time, between the input changing and the output changing, and it doesn't take any time, then yes, we would be pulling the rug under ourselves. Because whatever is presented to the input of register D in the register bank is influenced by whatever the program counter is. Fortunately, we have PD. What is PD again? Propagational delay, okay? In other words, even right at the rising edge, the program counter is gonna take its sweet time to update, which means the output of the program counter is gonna stay as zero one for a little bit of time. But at the very same time that we tell the program counter to update itself, register D already has the content of location zero two in RAM presented to its own D port. So that means the two registers are updating at exactly the same time. But it will take the same amount of propagational delay in order for the program counter to change its output. And by that time, register D would also have updated itself already. So we don't have a race condition whatsoever. Let's just say that you know, one register is a little bit faster, okay? So for the sake of argument, we're gonna say, okay, what if the program counter is just a little bit faster compared to register D to update itself? Wouldn't we be up, you know, pulling the rug under ourselves then? Well, tell me where this is going. What is the Q, the Q port of program counter connected to at this point of time? Through a multiplexer, right? Guess what? The multiplexer has its own propagational delay. And the worst part is RAM. RAM is super slow. Even if you wanted it to update like right away, it is going to take its sweet time. So we don't have a problem of pulling the rug under ourselves because of all the delays involved. Yes? That? I cannot answer. <laughs> I have not designed a processor as a as a as, as a computer engineer, so I'm not sure whether people you know, actually rely on the timing you know to do this. But I suspect that is the case because in uh, I'll get to that ju in just a little bit because in reality RAM is really slow. Um, you have to intentionally insert what we call wait states in order for RAM to work properly, both reading and writing. So it takes a long time when, after you change the address port content of RAM, it really takes a lot of time before the data port updates to whatever content you're addressing. 
So I'm fairly sure this is you know, not a problem with at least you know, older and simpler processors. With caching, maybe it's an issue. Yes, go ahead. Well, yes, yes, but we, because the program counter is a register, so is register D. It is also a register. They have the same propagational delay. So that means, you know, by the time the program counter has updated and its new content is reflected at the D port, I mean the Q port, register D would also have updated already. So that's why you know, I know for sure there's no way you know, we would be in a situation of pulling the rug under ourselves or this becoming a race condition. The only way this can become a race condition is the entire chain of the program counter, this multiplexer, and RAM are super fast you know, technology, and then you have gigantic transistors to implement you know, register D. That would be the only case you know, we can create a scenario where it becomes a race condition, but you really have to work hard to create that scenario. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Yep, go ahead. Uh huh. Yeah, yep, I would say so. I mean, you know, the the only time we really have a problem is when we have an actual transition. So how fast you can clock the whole thing is to make sure that we don't end up with a situation where you know two rising edges or you know would you have to make sure that nothing takes long so long that it would take the time between two rising edges to finish. That's the only thing you have to make sure. And you know, in these scenarios, we are not even coming close to that. Okay. Um, okay, so now we are going to have a rising edge, and there are two things you have to pay attention to. The first thing you will have to pay attention to is the program counter incrementing to become zero, one. The second thing you have to pay attention to, and I think we can do it at the same time, is to pay attention to register D. Because register D should get the 3, 1 in hexadecimal. In other words, when I type control T, you will see two things updating at exactly the same time. The program counter changing to 0, 2, and then register D becoming 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, which is 3, 1, which is how we specify 49 as a binary number. Are we OK with that? Are we ready for that? And of course, you, know, you guys cannot go track two things at the same time. So if you're sitting next to someone, you can say, I'm going to track PC and you're going to track register D. Or you can go back and look at the recording and go like, OK, I'm going to replay this. Okay, The first time, I'm going to take a look at register D. The second time, I'm going to you know, take a look at the program counter. That's another beauty of recording the class, you know, because hey, you can actually roll back and watch it again and focus on different things the second time. Okay. All right, so here comes control T. There we go. And you can see how register D is now becoming 0011, 0001, and how the program counter is now a 02. So how, what does that have anything to do with the RTL that we talked about a little bit earlier? So let me show the text editor here. So what we have just accomplished you know, talking about is this part here, which is you know, taking the output of RAM or the D part of RAM to update register D, and also the post increment of the program counter. Post increment, post what? Well, it's post dereference. Okay? We are done dereferencing, we are done updating register D, and the program counter increments. Is that okay so far? Okay. So this is this does depend a lot on your understanding of you know operators in C++, which in this case is, is the post increment and the dereference operator. 
So there are very, very good reasons why CISP360 is the prerequisite of this class. All right, are we good with this one? Are we good with the LDI instruction? Okay. So if someone in this class is wondering, so how do I study this stuff? There are no written modules whatsoever you know, with all this stuff here. So when I present you with a new instruction, okay, let me look at the time. We may or may not have enough time to do the next one. How do we study? Okay, so I'll give you an, uh, there was a hand. I thought there was a hand. Nope, okay. Yes, go ahead. Exactly. Okay, so I'll give you a little program to practice. Okay, so I think we have definitely enough time to give you a practice program. So the practice program is something like this. So LDI A with some particular value. I don't care what it is. Say 45. LDI B with another value. Let's say 7 A. Okay, and then I do a ST instruction. ST a, B. Okay. And we'll put a halt instruction right here. There we go. So now we have three instructions, four instructions. The halt instruction is really not one because it just says, okay, everything stops here. We are not proceeding post uh, after this point. So we only really got three instructions. The first two instructions, hmm, we just talked about it, the LDI instruction. So you go like, eh, I'll go through those you know, once, okay, because I just want to confirm my understanding. What, what about the ST instruction? Tech has not talked about that instruction. What am I going to do with that instruction? So what do you think you should do? Yes? Look it up on the opcode table, okay, so that you, you understand what it is supposed to do, right? So let's do that first, okay? So let's try to figure out what this program is supposed to do. So there we go. We look up the opcode table. And this time we're doing the reverse, which means we know the mnemonic already. Column B is, called, is, re, is referred to as the mnemonic. M-N-E-U-M-O-N-I-C. So mnemonic, the first M is silent. Is that the French word? Mnemonic? It's Latin? Okay. And what does it mean? What does mnemonic mean? Mm. Yep, that's what it is, mnemonic. A device such as a pattern of letters, ideas, or associations that assist in remembering something, okay? <clears throat> and how many of you have watched uh, John Wick and, okay, so, um, Keanu Reeves, you know, when he was much younger, he was the actor of a movie, a science fiction movie, which by today's standard is going to be a very interesting one to watch. It's called Johnny Mnemonic. Okay, so it's an interesting sci-fi movie, you know, but it, it does have some really interesting twists to it. Um, so if you have not watched it before and you have time, you know, it's, it's cool. Anyhow, so you look at your row 31, it is corresponding to the mnemonic of STYX, okay? So this time I reverse the order because the way I order the operands is the first operand or the left one is the one getting updated. The parentheses is my way of saying, okay, this is not just a register, it is a dereference of a register, okay? That's why, you know, I use, I, I specify the syntax, you know, this way to remind ourselves the Y is the one being dereferenced. So when you look at column C of row 31, it says whatever register Y is pointing to is updated to whatever register X has, okay? So in the context of this program, what are you going to expect to happen? And by the way, I have a little problem here because 7A is in hexadecimal and the assembler cannot handle he hexadecimal. So what is 7A in decimal? Come on, you guys can do this, quick. It's 122. Okay, how do I get it so quickly? 
because 80 would have been 128, because 80 is 8 times 16, which is 128. This is 6 short of 70, I mean 80. So that's why it is 128 in base 10 minus 6, which is 122. So that means, you know, ah, okay, I have to change this to decimal 122. There we go. So what do you think this instruction would end up doing? Now, so when you're doing this, you can kind of go through the first two instructions relatively quickly, but I would suggest you to kind of confirm the, all the observations that we have done today already. But when you get to the third one, you get, when you get to the execute phase of the instruction cycle, then you have to slow down, okay? Because now you have to take a look at the connectivity between the components. What do you expect when this happens? Go ahead. Okay, so this is the same thing as this, right? Because you know, we know which register has which value. So it ends up accomplishing this, which means whatever is at location 45, but you cannot see 45 in RAM because it's all in hexadecimal. So can someone quickly convert 45 in decimal into hexadecimal? It wouldn't be a six something, it would be a three, it would be a two something. Because a three is already 48 already, right? Because three times uh, 16 is 48. So this is, this has to be a two something. So two what? It would be a two D that is correct, okay? So location two D in RAM is updated to whatever we specify here earlier, which is what, a seven, No, it's not a seven eight. We are six short, okay? So it'll be a seven A. Okay, so I'm I'll put in the hexadecimal version too. So this way you know, when you are making your observation, you can compare that, right? So this is in hexadecimal two D is getting hexadecimal seven what again? A. Yep. <clears throat> this should be the effect of this particular instruction. Which means, by the time you get to this instruction, what kind of connectivity should you observe? The connectivity you should observe is register B somehow is connected to which part of RAM? Okay, RAM only has two ports that are really relevant in this case. The D port, very good, okay. So register B, the register bank should connect to the D port of RAM. What about register A? It connects to the A port of RAM, okay? So you should go through the analysis, look at all the multiplexers, all the demultiplexers, make sure you have that connectivity. What about RAM itself? How should it be configured? So first of all, you know, what signals are related to how RAM is configured? Okay, let's start with RAM cell, okay? RAM cell should be one, RAM load, zero, very good. So we know what RAM cell is, what RAM load should be. We know what the A port should be connected. The A port should be connected to register A from the register bank. We know uh, the D port of RAM should be connected to register B in the register bank, okay? And that's, those are all the important you know, way, things that you need to make sure. But I'm not going to do it now because you know, we are running out of time. We only got five minutes left. And this also serves as a very good way for you to practice. So I am basically giving you a ungraded assignment to do this before Thursday. Because on Thursday, the lab on Thursday depends on LD, LDI, and the ST instruction. Which means if you get a good understanding of how they work before Thursday, Thursday's lab would be pretty easy to do. But that's also giving you an opportunity to understand how to study at this point. There's no text for you to read because the entire processor is available. 
assuming you know, you know how each component works, the multiplexers, the demultiplexers, the RAM, the registers, the decoder, I mean, the, the various gates that we use, but we should know those already. So that means you, know, you are just really using this kind of program as a kind of, as an exercise to understand you know, how things are connected in the processor. And in this process, you will also understand you know, how, the, how the assembler fit into this whole picture. Because you know, the assembler is here so that you don't have to remember all the zeros and ones in the opcode. The assembler will do it for you. All you have to remember are the mnemonics, which would be LDI, LD, NOP, halt um, at this point. And also add, we kind of talked about add last Thursday. So are we good so far? Okay. So I will not be giving you actual homework assignment other than what we do in the lab, but it is super important that you actually do what I suggest to do, because otherwise you would not be having a thorough enough understanding of how the processor works, and that's going to be in exam two. So we are getting close to exam two, not quite. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Um, okay, so in order to get to exam two, I want to be able to go over the jump instructions and also the compare instructions. So maybe in two more classes, we, we would have covered all the material, and then I'll give you a practice exam, and then one week after the practice exam is the actual exam. So I'm going to put it at least you know, two weeks out. At least, yep. So the second exam is going to be about two weeks out, um, but the pace will pick up at this point, okay? You know, because you know, and it's super important that you guys spend your time to do the suggested activity. And before you do that, you have to kind of make sure you understand all the material first. So there's a lot of stuff that you have to do on your own at this point of time. But we do have a lab today, okay? You know, tonight's lab is something that I originally scheduled incorrectly on uh, last Thursday. So we are gonna do it today. I forgot to take road, that's okay, it's not a big deal. So tonight's lab is here. It has an access code of TTP ASM all in uppercase, which stands for Tax Toy Processor Assembler, okay? In that, yes, that's the tool that you're dealing with, okay? That is the tool that you're dealing with. That's the name of the assembler. So you'll be doing that, but you still have to recall what you learned last Thursday, okay? I'll be at the lab in a few minutes. <laughs>